Vampires, we love them, don't we? Mythological blood drinkers have been around since ancient Babylonia. See Lelutu, or the Greek Lamias, the Malay Penangalan, Yes, those are its guts, gross. While these stories have been popular since the dawn of man, there has been only one definitive vamp whose dark influence has reached across the entire globe. You guessed it, it's Count Dracula. He's like the friend your parents warned you about, dangerous but alluring. Think Jerry from Fright Night. Look at that guy, look at those eyes. Foreign yet familiar, monstrous yet human, powerful yet lonely, Dracula presents a specific reflection of ourselves, thrilling and chilling to behold. Birthed in the literary age of Shelley's Frankenstein and Poe's Telltale Heart, it's cinema that's given the Prince of Darkness immortality. And across a hundred years, from Bella Lugosi to Adam Sandler, how has the old guy changed? First, a bite-sized history of the character's origins. Contrary to popular belief, Vlad Tepes of Wallachia, aka Vlad the Impaler, though a nasty fellow, was not the inspiration for the blood drinker. Stoker stumbled upon the word Dracula, which translates to devil and appropriated it. Irish author Bram Stoker came up with his character in 1897 after having a nightmarish dream caused by eating too much dressed crab. Yum! Stoker combined that nightmare with European folklore, like the creepy Irish monster Apartheid, along with inspiration from previous vampire novels like Carmilla. There's countless ideas on what Dracula reflected of the society back then. The Transylvanian may have embodied the fear of foreign influences or anxieties about fluid sexuality. Some assert he's a metaphor for capitalist monopolies. No matter how you look at it, people connected with Dracula. Good evening. So who was Patient Zero? He went by Count Orlock, but a rose by any other name was Dracula at heart. The 1922 film was Nosferatu by F.W. Murnau. The Stoker estate sued for copyright infringement and the film was ordered to be destroyed. But like the character itself, the movie somehow survived and went on to become a classic. Max Schreck played Orlock and gave the world a whole new way to see Dracula. Handsome? No. Magically charismatic? The sailors on that ship didn't think so. This guy was all monster, a horrifying plague-carrying creature. And Myrna, an auteur of the German expressionist movement, distorted the setting with abstract lighting and unnatural spaces to create the sensation of a nightmare rather than something realistic. What was this horrifying vision reflecting for the audience then? Perhaps it was the all too real nightmare of post-World War I Germany, a world in ruins after normal people had been forced to act monstrously. As a result, both cinema and Dracula were reinvented and the character was forever tied to a whole new genre. Less than 10 years later, Bela Lugosi crept onto the screen and gave the world its second Dracula. You don't need us to tell you it was a hit, forever cementing the Hollywood version of the story. Glossy, romantic, the good guy Van Helsing stakes the villain at the end. And unlike Murnau with his crazy shadows, director Todd Browning told the story through an objective camera style, aiming for realism. Universal had co-opted the monster to tell a classic American story of good guy exceptionalism. Above all, the film gave us Lugosi's version of The Count, aristocratic with a mesmerizing gaze in that special way of taking creepy, long pauses. He was so good he'd be typecast in the villainous role for the rest of his career. It wasn't until 1948 that we got a whole different sort of Count, in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Even though it was Lugosi reprising the role, you might say that the stakes <laughs> were different. That moment when Costello reads about Dracula beside his coffin, Lugosi's shocked eyebrows let you know that when this vampire kills, it's for laughs. Ha ha ha! The very aspects of Dracula that were scary before, like the eerie sound effects, were turned on their head for humor. It showed the audience that you can enjoy the same things that frighten you. Like the others, this version turned out to be a hit and firmly established a new comedic genre for the count. We're only about 20 years into Dracula's screen career, and already we have three totally different versions. The guy doesn't only shape change, he's got range. But to go through every single Dracula role since Abbott and Costello would require, well, being immortal. But it's uncanny to see how almost every version, from Helsing's a la carte to Count Dracula, yeah, we're talking serial, plays off the expectations of one of these three initial versions, while also attempting something original. Like Christopher Lee in the Hammer film series, starting with Dracula in 1958 that went on till 1974. Another classic take in its own right, Lee continues in the debonair Bela Lugosi mold while making Dracula less cartoonish, instead more subtle. More humanly terrifying within a grittier film style in line with the new Hollywood movement. Whereas Nosferatu's Children of the Night are more varied. Take for instance Werner Herzog's remake, Nosferatu the Vampire, and the self-referential Shadow of the Vampire, or other auteur films that challenge our expectations of the genre, like Only Lovers Left Alive, or Let the Right One In. 
The hit TV series The Strain clearly follows in Nosferatu's footsteps as well, depicting vampires as monsters of contagion. Meanwhile, there have been countless counts to make you laugh. Leslie Nielsen and Mel Brooks' Dracula, dead and loving it. Watch out for the foot. Stool. Adam Sandler in Hotel Transylvania, well, we can decide if he was funny in that. And how could we forget the monster of our childhood, Count Von Count of Sesame Street? One, two, ah, ah, ah. In more recent years, amidst the vampire genre explosion, there have been stranger attempts at recreating Dracula. Coppola's film, Bram Stoker's Dracula, for example, mixed the book's traditional Dracula with operatic myths of Vlad the Impaler, all while referencing classic Dracula cinema. What sweet music like mine. However, not all princes of darkness are created equal. Take Dracula 2000 or Dracula Untold, for example. They attempted to branch into sexy contemporary retelling or epic medieval battles. Both were poorly received. Dracula should continue to be a mirror into the individual and society's inner darkness. With each new version, we should get a new reflection of ourselves. Whether it's the actor who allows us to empathize with a monster or laugh at him, or a cinematic world that scarily aligns with our own, as long as we have films and television, and as long as our society continues to change, we'll have new Draculas rising out of their coffins to look back at. Like, share, hit that notification button, let us know in the comments what version of Dracula you would like to see next, and follow Gamma Ray across the web.